Pitch Talks, brought to you by North Star Bets. That's a win. Come on in, sit right down, and join us. It is time for another episode of Pitch Talks. I'm your boy, Andrew Zuber, from The Parlay, joined as always by Nick Ashburn from North Star Bets. Realize I forgot to intro you last week because I was so overcome with the emotion of the 8-1 to blown lead of the Blue Jays last game of the season that I was like, forget the intro, forget the name of the podcast, <laughs> help me deal with this immediately. Uh, we've moved on, we've compartmentalized, we've gone through the stages of grief. We are now here at the AL and NLCS. Yeah, I mean, now it's more of a, it's a pure baseball thing at this point. In theory, you know, it's the <laughs> best teams that are here and it's the highest quality of baseball. We're going to talk about how, you know, maybe it's not that sometimes. And, uh, you know, the playoffs are maybe a whole sham. <laughs> but uh, theoretically, that's where it's at, where you can really enjoy sort of the best of the best. But as we know, it doesn't always work like that. On one side of the bracket, it seems to, right? We've got the Yankees. We've got the Astros. That's probably what you would have bet on at the beginning of the year if you're going to bet on a matchup. And, uh, you know, it's been enjoyable so far to be a little bit more detached and kind of appreciate baseball for baseball's sake. Yeah, the, the, the hyper fixation that I think... I know I personally tend to get into during the every single day for six months. You you are watching one team over and over again. And you're super uh, aware of the strengths and weaknesses, and then it plays out, and you're like, oh, now what? And I agree with you. You're able to sort of um, sit back and smirk when another fan base is completely gutted. You know, and the Seattle Mariners, <laughs> just as one example. To pick a name out just of a hat. Just one or, example. Or the I can't even imagine if I was a Mets fan oh. how to watch the team win a, a hundred games and then. <laughs> Oh, no, it's over in a weekend. I would be uh, used to it on one hand yeah. and also very upset. So as you said, a, a reset of sorts. Uh, we have four teams left. We are in the AL and NLCS. A lot of um, the talking points have been thrown around. As you said, maybe the playoffs are a sham has been a, a bit of a talking point. You know, American League matchups aside, there are uh, a tendency, I think, for fans and for maybe executives of well, we call these things like a copycat league, right? A, a team does something successful. Remember with this with the 2015 Royals. So, oh, the way they're using their bullpen, everyone's going to do this going forward. My question for you is, are there learnings from the four teams that are left? We can go team by team, but is there a general learning that you're seeing before we dig in team by team? I, I think that the overall thing is probably the boring answer, which is let's not overreact to this. We're talking about four teams. We're talking about one playoffs, you know, dozens of games by the time this is done. Like, you know, a team will go into April three weeks in, a, a couple dozen games in, and you'll say, I don't know what this team is. So mm -hmm. now we're doing this and with the playoffs with a bunch of different teams. Are we going to be sure we know something? I'm not sure about that. I will say that the Phillies really strike me just because they are <laughs> this, you know, this Phillies. underdog team. They're building this weird way. I think they're actually a nice reminder to the Blue Jays fan base in general because a lot of Blue Jays fans get after the, you know, Bows a defensively inept shortstop. Can you win with that? The Warner outfielders aren't very good in the field. Can you win with that? The starters are so much better than the relievers. Is that a huge problem? And what the Phillies do is they provide a reminder that the shape of it maybe isn't as important. It's sure. the quality of it. And so they have this power in, this, in the lineup. They have these incredible two starting pitchers, which can take you a long way in the playoffs. And it's okay to have flaws because every team has flaws. And I don't think it matters as much what flaws they are as some people believe. Like this team is terrible on defense. <laughs> they cannot field the ball. I love them. This is like yeah. a, a beer league softball team out there in the outfield. But if you're good enough at the other things and you get a few breaks, sure. undoubtedly, um, I think that is the learning there. Like let, you said, hyperfixation, it was a different context, but I like that phrase. We get hyperfixated on what exactly does a successful playoff team look like. And I think it's okay to let that go sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm loving the Phillies. I'm loving the, we talked about the baseball itself in the playoffs is chaotic. Why not build the most chaotic team you can think of? <laughs> Completely disregard positions. Positionless baseball in a bad way. <laughs> not in the flexibility, in the complete lack of flexibility. Nobody can play anywhere. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. I think it's genius. I think uh, a great point you made there, starting with the Phillies, about how it is a bit of a helpful example for Blue Jays fans to, to as you said, like um, Teoscar Hernandez or, or Lourdes Gurriel, where it's like they have these defensive shortcomings but if they're hitting, it really doesn't matter as much. They're they're probably not going to cost you as much defensively as they will provide for you. Off, like Kyle Schwarber is the perfect example. Is he going to save you a bunch of runs defensively? Absolutely not. Is he going to hit 45 taters? <laughs> a pretty good chance he might. It absolutely rocks. I, I think it's really important as well as 
you know, there's a lot of different ways to build the team and you hear about, um, you know, balance one through nine or um, I don't want to use stars and scrubs, but the idea of you have the Bryce Harpers, you have the really good hitters, then you have some guys, you know, that you probably wouldn't put on that list of really exciting talent on that Phillies team. But it works because the guys who are good are playing well enough when it matters, which is, as you said, a dozen games. It's a two week hot streak. You know, Santiago Espinal was an all star for a month. Uh, these things happen. I think it is really an interesting learning. There's uh, three other teams to get through here. What have you learned about the playoffs from the San Diego Padres? I mean, the big thing with the Padres is the absence of Fernando Tatis Jr., right? And I think that when that happened, it was very easy to say, this is your franchise player. This is a perennial NL MVP candidate. How are they possibly going to be as dangerous without them? Uh, without this guy and this is something I actually talked about a few episodes ago and I'm not doing that to be like I'm the smartest man who's ever lived so don't feel bad oh yeah yeah I mean you you tend to come in for that role if needed but (laughs) the reality is that you know there's only so much that one baseball player can do Mike Trout is a constant example of this Otani has maybe taken up the mantle of that now it's hilarious that they're on the same team um but when you have a team that's balanced throughout and they have, you know, their ace, you Darvish, maybe at this point in his career, not the best ace in the playoffs. Like their number two guy, Musgrove, like, again, really good pitcher. Actually, at times in the Cy Young conversation this year, but you could probably say, you know, Zach Wheeler on the Phillies is a more impressive pitcher than he is. You know, Blake Snell at this point in his career, is he the best number three out there? No, but they have consistently good players up and down the lineup, through the rotation, in the bullpen, And they may not be beating you. They're top six players against your top six players, but their players seven through 26 are really good. And often that's what wins you baseball games. I think that's a great point. And I would add um, a small learning that I think a team could figure out. It's good to add Juan Soto. Yeah. When available, (laughs) uh, generational talents at the deadline, give it a shot. But to a greater point than to your greater point, I think a learning for me there is um, just – keep adding talent and worry about it later, right? Is, is as you said, they lost Tatis. They went out and got Soto. They, they didn't say, oh, we lost a key guy. Let's be careful. Let's push it down the road. Let's worry about it. Let, let's not, you know, be as aggressive because we're missing this huge piece. They said, no, let's continue to add pitching. Let's, let, you know, they, they, you said you mentioned Musgrove, you mentioned Darvish, Blake Snell. They went out and they continued uh, to get important pitchers not even saying we have oh we have four or five guys that are important let's get six let's get seven let's let's just keep going if people are still going to keep buying our prospects let's keep buying great players i think that's um a really important thing and something that i know maybe has worried a few people when the playoffs got expanded was you know teams especially now that teams are, are, are you know going from the wild card in the nl all the way to the ALC, nlcs is like maybe we don't need to push all in i think the padres are a good example of you know, talent is talent. There was a talk around the deadline about, you know, what are, the, what are you going to do with Eric Hosmer? What are you going to do with all these guys? What do you keep figure pl- it out? Figure it out. Pay the money and then win the games. It, 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 it you know, that's a little reductive. That's a little obvious, but it's what it's all about. Like, there, there it, it really is sort of a, a, a wake up for me of, of just like sometimes we worry a little bit too much about positional fit, about lineup construction. Sometimes it is as easy as like, just go get a lot of guys who can hit and put them in and let them do their thing. Let them be themselves. And I think, I think San Diego is a good example of that. And the Phillies are too, but San Diego is a good example of um, don't let those bad breaks keep you from your philosophy. And that philosophy has been top end talent over everything. And it's uh, here they are now in the NLCS. Yeah. I mean, one thing that made them able to do that is that they had this farm system where they keep generating guys that were valued around the league. Sure. And so it's not so easy for every team to go out and do those things. And so that's interesting because a lot of teams get that farm system and they say, we're going to be great for 12 years, just wait on it. And the Padre said, nah, let's just use this to get great now. And I think that's a really cool approach. But to have that approach, especially for a small market team, although they do spend money for their market, you have to develop these players in order to have that ammunition. And not a lot of people are doing it like they can do it. It's a great point. I think you see Seattle as a, as a starting example of that, of a team that is blended in young talent with paying the cost for for the Castillos, for the Eugenio Suarez, whoever they need to get. They've gone out and got it to supplement that lineup. I think that's a great observation as well. Move over to the American League. Uh, I don't know if, like, what can you even learn from the Houston Astros? Be great yeah. for a really long time. It's like, <laughs> nice, to, nice if you have it. Yeah, I mean, their pitching staff is something that I would point to just because when you think of the Astros, you think of Altuve and 
Alvarez and that lineup. A lot of that core has been there for a long time. I know they lost Springer and Correa over time, but the lineup feels familiar, right? You're like, oh, yeah, of course these guys are good. Mm-hmm. Um, but what they've done is they've really stacked starting depth, like to the point where they're trading starters away, which seems wild for a team that's that good. And so as a result of that, they're able to bring Luis Garcia out of the bullpen yeah. in a huge spot in a game that one run is going to win the game. That's the thing that's interesting to me because a lot of these teams are getting by because they have the top end town, the one, two, three, they're surviving the playoffs. The Astros are so much deeper than that. And I think that that makes them extremely dangerous. But like you said, they've been favorites since day one in that division. They've been favorites basically every year they line up in that division and not a lot has changed. They're backfilling guys who have left, I guess, pretty well with guys like Tucker and, and Pena now, but it's hard to go too deep into uh, just have incredibly good player development, have some money, and uh, have Justin Verlander come back. Yeah, I can't think of many teams that would be able to let Correa and Springer and Garrett Cole go and, A, not get, like, roasted for it constantly. <laughs> not be like, wow, small market Houston can't get it done. But also be like, oh, that doesn't affect us at all. We are still the favorite in the American League. We're still going to win the American League West despite Otani, despite Trout, despite Seattle, despite whatever you want to throw in our way, the raise of vacation of the A's every year. Uh, they just continue to roll on. And I think, you know, a, a sneaky subplot to that, as you mentioned, with San Diego is as well with Houston is identifying that pipeline talent of, you know, where can we swallow the hard pills? Where can we take that tough losses, like a, a leader like Springer, a, a, an everyday shortstop like Correa, not easy to find, a, a number one best in the league, absolute Cy Young ace like Garrett Cole was when he was in Houston. To say, we can let that happen. It's, it's, it's not going to ruin our World Series chances. Uh, it's a really impressive thing of development. And, and a lot of teams can say, we're doing the development thing. We want to be a consistent winner. It's another thing to replace those guys with with, a, with Jeremy Pena. It really has been impressive. Uh, as impressive as it has been annoying, which is uh, a lot. <laughs> speaking of annoying, speaking of impressive, I uh, think for two months straight, we have been here like, don't bet on the Yankees <laughs> to win the World Series. Uh, Aaron Boone might help us with this, thankfully. But here we are in the ALCS yet again. It's Yankees-Astros. It's not the most exciting thing. What are we learning from the New York Yankees? I think it's just, a you know, especially from a betting standpoint, you don't have to get caught up in the vibes all the time. People sure, get yeah. in that trust the gut mode, this looks wrong to me mode. And sometimes you need to take a step back and be like, you know, the Yankees were pretty much not going to lose the AL East. There was a moment where there was a bit of a wobble, but even then, yeah, they, were, May, yeah, they were like 90 plus percent favorites the vast majority of the time. And just because you end the regular season, and this applies to the Phillies too. The the Phillies did not end the regular season well. Like they did almost everything they could to piss away their chances of making the playoffs. (laughs) Just because you don't end the regular season well, it does not mean that your playoff chances are gone. And it was so easy for us to say, oh, this Yankees team got to a hot start and for X amount of time, they haven't been special. Well, it's not really working like that. Like it's an 162 game season for a reason. You look at the holistic value of what a team produces Turns out they were a good team. As much as many of us would like to believe that the Yankees were trash, they never were, Just because they, just because they win a lot, that's all? Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. I think absolutely right. Um, I, think you, I think you sort of nailed it there is uh, a little bit as well of, of, of baseball momentum is a different animal than I think other sports. And I, those vibes, those good feelings, I don't know that other than Aaron Judge, it felt great to be uh, observing these Yankees week in and week out. And yet, here they were. Uh, winning a ton of games, you know, it, it, I'm speechless. I, I'm choking on my own rage here. I, I'm just, just going to have to take my medicine and, and admit, as you said, that they're uh, one of the final four teams and they were a good team all year long and they won games despite how much it didn't make sense, how many terrible Josh at Donaldson at bats, how many uh, kind of filet fat bats. You're just like, what is this guy doing here? Uh, they managed to get it done and uh, not easy, clearly, and and yet. And yet, and yet here it's, you know, if it were an NFL football team, for instance, and they really struggled down the stretch after starting five and oh, let's say you might say, oh, well, teams are figuring these guys out. Like they've got their tendencies. They've locked in on their offense. Their play calling is getting stale in the NBA with they haven't they had these great rotations, but now teams are finding the match. It just doesn't quite work that way in baseball. There really isn't a defense for Aaron Judge. There isn't a defense for. Stan when he, mm-hmm. he's looking at the height of his powers. And I think that reason is why, yeah, momentum is something that 
we should probably dismiss a little bit more and it's just wormed its way into our heads from the other sports we've been watching realistically yeah i think uh also the value of good enough right is is the lineup isn't great no but it's good enough to win games defense hasn't been amazing no but it's good enough to win games the starting pitching is is good enough the bullpen's been good enough it hasn't it hasn't maybe it hasn't jumped off the screen lately but you know it's none of it is crippling them none of them is holding it but all of it is good enough to get them to where they are which is in the alcs against a very good houston team that is a good look at the four teams are left we are going to get a little bit more into that but first i think it's time to dive into the old twitter mailbag absolutely let me let me do the zoobs roll for a moment here and get in here and see what the people have been saying it was a little bit less absurd this week i think than we often get but that is okay it is okay to answer some <laughs> baseball questions uh once in a while we have from at jay's retro between two options, which is more likely, Bo moving to second base or Bo being traded? There are a lot of these type of thoughts in Blue Jays' world right now. Zoobs, what do you think? Lightning rod is the word, I think, for what <laughs> Bo Wichet is. I think, I think, talking about more likely, I think the answer easily is Bo moving to second base. I think you look at the history of, we talked about this before, but guys as valuable as Bo is with his the the age that he's at and the part of his career that he's at with the success that he's had, warts and all very rare that a team makes what would be basically a challenge trade like you're you're not it, it, you're not rebuilding right you're not trading yeah. for prospects so you're you're gonna have to basically get a shortstop back like there's you don't have unless you're thinking espinal you could i mean he's one of those he's one of those ones where like it's almost like the more he plays the more worried you are about it it's like the a guy that is great in a in a in a role but i don't know that 162 games of sante go espinal or 150, yeah. whatever it may be. I don't know that that's the answer, that you're something like, okay, now we're going to be a better team. So he's a really hard guy to replace. And if he's at second base, we saw last year with Marcus Simeon how valuable it was to have an incredibly good hitting second baseman beside a good hitting shortstop. If you can add a shortstop, I know the shortstop market, um, there's some high-end stuff. There's some middle ground stuff as well. I think it's probably easier to find a replacement uh, to fit into the lineup than it is to find a trade for Bo Bichette that makes you think we definitely got better today. You can you can pie in the sky and say, oh, they go go get Otani. It's that easy, right? Because then you have a starter and an outfielder, but then you have this huge glaring hole at your most important infield position. I don't think it's going to be as easy to find a good trade partner for Bichette as it is to uh, find an internal or external shortstop replacement if you're going to move him to second base. Yeah, I think that the boring answer is that neither is likely. Sure. I think he's, you know, he's the shortstop for this team for the foreseeable future. They've had opportunities with Semyon to move him off. They had opportunities to get shortstops when there's kind of that golden era of yep. top flight shortstops being available. That's really going to be hard to replicate going forward here. That's been a big part of his story, the fact that he wants to play shortstop and he's overcome people telling him he couldn't. I just don't know if the team's going down this road with him. I'd be very surprised. Uh, is it the best thing for the Blue Jays to have him play second base? Potentially, but also, like you said, pretty hard to find a really good shortstop. It's like you're creating another problem there. Espinal, probably more of a platoon guy, especially at shortstop. Like he's, he looks so good at as a halftime second baseman. Yeah. Like that's a great role for him. He's really good against left handed pitchers. He's, his defense is really good there. You put him at shortstop, his defense might be more like decent you yeah. know what i mean like we haven't seen him there for an extended period of time so you know jay's retro is going to be a little bit disappointed here but that's my boring answer is that neither is likely in my opinion uh we go to it looks real uh should minute Maid park be burned to the ground and replaced with a stadium containing field dimensions for adults this is a west coast <laughs> fan of the seattle mariners i know uh weighing in uh your thoughts on the unique nature politely said of minute Maid field in uh, in houston yeah, I mean, I think sometimes you got to take the question, you got to twist into something else. We're not <laughs> going to endorse arson here. I'm sorry. Um, and not publicly, you know? Like, exactly right. You can, right. yeah, find me in the DMs. <laughs> we can talk about arson anytime. Um, but you know what? I'm all for it. I, it is a silly, it is a bit of a silly ballpark, undoubtedly. But I love that about baseball. I love that all the parks are different. I love that people have this idea of, traveling to ballparks all around mm. north america like that's something that i like to do i went to pittsburgh this year i thought pnc absolutely delivered Incredible. for example 
And, you know, no one's saying that about hockey. No one's like, oh, I can't wait to go see the cap. Like, I don't, I don't know. I can't wait to go see the Capitals rink. Yeah. Can't wait to see where the Avalanche play. Like, no, that's just not part of I mean, That's just not part of it. I think it's cool. I think it's cool how you can team build a little bit around your ballpark. You know, not extremely, but you can do a little bit of that. Uh, so it gives, it gives a game character. It makes things different. When you watch your team on the road, often you're watching your team in a ballpark you're not super familiar with, and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that you can get triples in that weird nook right. over there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that Roger Center, the renovations they're doing, are going to be great for making, you know, adding that element to it a little bit. I don't, you know, it's never going to be Fenway Park. It's going to be uh, a less standardized version of what we know now. But, I, yeah, I'm not burning Minute Made to the ground, and... You can quibble with some of the individual ballparks in terms of would I do this or that with the walls, but it's just such a great part of baseball that I'm inclined to let it be. The hill in the pole in center field is gone. So yeah, <laughs> that, that, yeah, safety <laughs> issues are safety issues. Yeah, I'm with you. I think the character and the unique nature of the game is uh, a feature, not a bug. It's sort yeah. of it's it's neat. You mentioned Fenway. How many times have you seen the? The, the the laser that should be a home run that goes off the monster and the guy, the guy doesn't know how to play it or the ball in the triangle that a, a young center fielder or, or Jaron Duran doing anything in center field for the for the Red Sox doesn't know how to play it and it's pandemonium and it's a Ron Maltapia inside the park grand slam suddenly uh, I think it adds a ton of flavor I don't want to do the old cliche Houston has to play there too yada yada mm. we all know but uh, yeah I'm for the character of the field I totally get why watching your team lose to the Houston Astros there would be frustrating. You could do something like a minimum wall dimension such sure. that you avoid the short porch in Yankees. I, I I think maybe there'd be something to that. You know, we saw an example of this going wrong, right? We saw it with uh, Camden Yards in Baltimore. Yeah. And they changed up left field. And I don't think anyone was happy with how that went. Sometimes it's okay to be a little bit different. We've got 1959, Stephen. This is sort of a question. Uh, I'd like to see some analysis and practicality on what it will take for the Blue Jays to control payroll next year, next year, et cetera. Uh, I feel like there's possibility Teoscar might get traded to move some payroll out over the next few years. It's interesting, right? Like they have been in this situation where their best players have cost them virtually nothing. And mm -hmm. they have had the luxury of saying, you know what? Who's the best position player in free agency? George Springer, let's offer him a bigger contract than anyone else. Like before that, we're not really feeling like we're going to contend this year, but let's go get Ryu. Like he's one of the top starters on the market. And, you know, offering the big extension to Barrios and Gosman. And the thing is that they've locked those guys in. Like there's not money's coming on, but money's not really coming off mm -hmm. with this team right now. So they need to determine is there going to be a significantly higher payroll that they're just going to grow into with this core? which I think would be a valid way to look at it. Totally. But if they're not going to do that, then Teoscar, yeah, I think in 2023, he will come at a decent price, but one that they would accept because he, him and his last year of arbitration is a good deal. Certainly. Undoubtedly. Um, but it could be, you know, we're just not going to deal with Teoscar going forward. Like we can't afford to add another huge extension onto the books. In fact, if you ask me, is Teoscar a Blue Jay in 2024? I probably would tell you, my gut right now says no. Right. Uh, and Chapman, you could argue the same thing. I, I think it is not, is going to be more about potentially not retaining players as opposed to shipping guys out. Because they're still in the middle of this competitive window. They feel like they have a good chance to win the World Series. You don't win the World Series by getting rid of Teoscar Hernandez and Matt Chapman. Yeah, I, I agree with that fully. I think Teoscar is, when you're talking about the lineup depth, you're talking about uh, assembling talent, guys who can hit, he fits right in there. Uh, you know, if we're if we're just randomly throwing out names that may not that that may help you cut a little bit of cost here and there i don't know if you know lourdes guriello's one for me was like you probably get decent value for him because he still has a, he still has it's not expiring it's still have like a year and then i think another one i'm not, not sure i think it's just the one now yeah they've, the one after they've changed the the that's right the arbitration and they send that deal before when he first signed in but you know they also don't have a ton of guys that are under control for a long time that aren't like super core pieces right that that it's either the Teoscar Chapman class who are coming up in 23 and 24 as expirings or the guys who are locked in as the core. So it's not going to be super easy to move off of money. I, as much as it would be great to be like, oh, they should get rid of Kikuchi. It's like, I don't know that they're dumping that $20 million on anybody. It's going to be a challenge. You're, you're, it's going to be more likely that they bet on a Barrios bounce back, that they bet on 
the one year arbitration deal for Tay Oscar that they bet they're betting on believing in this core, right? We, we've taken a week now, we take a step back, we've taken a breath. We say back to back 90 wins, still uh, very good, very talented offense that underperformed this year for a number of reasons. Tay Oscar didn't have a great year, Guriel didn't have. You know, he, he average was pretty high, and he hit well with that runners in position, but didn't really have the power. It took Bo a while to get going. Vlad wasn't an MVP candidate. Chapman even was sort of middling. You could say, like, you know, in 2021, it felt like a lot of guys had career years. In 2022, it felt like a lot of guys underperformed. If you believe the truth is somewhere in the middle, they're probably a 94-win team still as constructed, and you're looking at, conservatively, a $170 million payroll, which is not cheap. But it's not also not exorbitant in the in the grand scheme of things. Could you add 10, 15, 20 million dollars to that? You're getting there. Yeah. And then potentially that's even just replacing Stripling, right? Like it is gonna eat a, a big part of that. They need yeah, a starter that they're gonna have to pay for too. So it, it is tough. I think people underestimate how tough it is because we keep getting this message of this is a young team, this is a team that's here to contend for a long time, and they're still young, but being young is often just a proxy for being cheap the way people sure. talk about yeah, it right yeah. so it's like you may still be young but you're not you're not serving the role of a young player in baseball's arguably twisted and messed up ecosystem which is to not make nearly as much of, as you're worth so yeah you can be a young vladdy but you're getting to be an old vladdy in the making money department and it's it's going to be tricky and they they got to see about some of these extensions at a certain point and if you lock in Vladdy, for instance, like now you're getting very tight because sure. you've been counting on having that space thank to him, thanks to him being underpaid for a while now. Yeah, it, I think it, the, the the good news and bad news is, you know, you're not riddled with holes in the lineup. There's not a, like you obviously there's improvements to make and decisions to make. And if you want to make upgrades, like you probably need a center fielder for Springer more often than not. You're probably going to need. Maybe a shortstop, you know, and then maybe another infielder, unless you're really comfortable with the Merrifield, Espinal, uh, Biggio, Triumvirate at second base. High it, leverage arms. High leverage arms, another least. starter or yeah. two. Yeah. Like, the the, the the pitching is not going to come cheap, uh, which is just sort of the nature of pitching. And we talked about San Diego. We talked about uh, these other teams, that Houston. Like, if they want to be a sustainable winner, which they had said they want to do, they're going to have to develop someone that can come in here it's, and get an out. It's it, 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 <laughs> yeah. ideally 15 outs, but like I'd settle for Anna. For sure. You, and you can blame whoever you want for this, but like Nate Pearson not pitching for the last two years has set them off course in that developmental like help coming on the way. I think he was somebody that they really counted were in their dream scenario of how these last two years went. Nate Pearson was a part of that plan, whether it be oh, as an absolute absolutely. arm of the bullpen or a guy who was keeping you from having to use if, Mitch White. If Ricky Tiedemann gets a shoulder injury on April 12th next year. Forget it. Where's the next guy coming from? It's tough. It's like, I, and I'm not saying that there's no one there who has any talent and we could like name some names who are in the system who have sure. promise. But in terms of guys who are coming that you feel confident that are going to make an impact, like he's the name. Yeah. And beyond that, there really isn't anything. So you know what? That was a nice, cheerful uh, answer for uh, for. I mean, I guess they they asked uh, 1959. Stephen asked for practicality. So what do we, we do provided like practicality yeah. there. It's a bit of a grim picture in a sense. Still, largely speaking, a good team. Zoobs, let's play a little bit of a good take, bad take before we hit the run line and get out of here. Let's do it. Uh, I'll start. We, we, you want know, a good take or my bad take first? Uh, let's let's start good and just go just go downhill. It's, Good take for me is I think next year's little more balanced schedule will calm some of the fires that were stoked this year about the playoff structure. I think people, you see the numbers. I know I personally, I saw, there was the Cleveland Guardians they tweeted out, we play baseball the right way, yada, yada, yada. Uh, that one didn't hurt me. When they did the... That was pretty cringe. The Cleveland Guardians did a nobody believed in us, but we won the division tweet when they won 85 games. And I was like, that's... Imagine a world where winning 85 games lets you boast and like strut around. Like we did it. We won 85 games. Like I was the so... White Sox didn't show up this year. I, I, I think there'll be a little bit more um, feeling that the right teams are winning, which is a weird way to put it. But I think, th I think a little more balanced schedule, a little more seeing other teams. I think fans will be a little calmer when the playoffs get sorted out. Like it's hard. It's hard to watch 
uh, when you're a fan of a team in the American League East, you know, you're watching Cleveland beat up on these terrible teams. And yes, they won their games in the playoffs so that it, it eventually goes away. But you sit there and you go, man, if we were playing the White Sox and the Royals and over and over again, it would be 110. You, I, I can't imagine how many times I would have sat there if the Jays had played in the Central in the last 20 years. What playoff drought? This is this is simple. We don't have, we don't have to have nearly as much firepower as we do in the American League. I think uh, playing everybody playing sort of a more fair schedule, I think, will give us a little more um, reasonable idea of who the best teams really are. So two things. One, generally speaking, I agree with that. Two, my good take is going to run 100% contrary. That's perfect. My belief, my good take, is that no playoff format will satisfy anyone. Yeah, that's probably true. Baseball is just not designed well for the playoffs. We know this. We know how fluky things can be over short periods of time when you have three-game series, which you know I think in a way is better than the one-game wild card they used to have. I'm not even complaining about it. When you have five-game series, when you had seven-game series, like really – if you wanted to decide who is the best team in the in all of the league, well, first of all, you could just look at the 162. You could just be the English <laughs> Premier League. Like, okay, I was here's, say, I was waiting. here's I was what like, we want. He, he's going to mention the but, but if we're going to do the North American thing, like really you would take, I don't know, maybe the top four teams by record and you would have them play like, best of 13 series right. or something like, like that yeah. but nobody has any appetite for that we're only going to do best of seven at the very longest and you know also there's you know there's weather concerns not all clubs have root like we've already seen the weather be a little bit of a nightmare in these playoffs i just think that the reality is okay so let's say we make it smaller so that only the good teams make in well then in september people are like wow for 65 for some of the fan bases there's no reason to watch and like so it that ruins that a little bit like the inclusivity of this thing is great but then when you add all these teams in you get the phillies are one of the last four teams and they're trash like how did this happen what can you do and i just don't think there's a middle ground like people are always i don't want to be that guy who's like there's a problem and there's no solution because there's a lot of those guys on twitter <laughs> just in general yeah, better things lot, aren't possible <laughs> a lot, yeah a lot of people who are just totally ready to say this sucks and have no imagination for creating a better solution but i do think just in terms of baseball and the north american notion of playoffs it does not really work in a sense and we just need to live at peace with the imperfections that exist. And I actually think that this format is pretty good. I think it's about as good as we're going to get. Yeah. I am also wary to your point. I'm wary of trying to find solutions to, to like what I would call like a one year problem. You look at the NL East this year. You're like, Oh man, one of these hundred win teams is going home quickly. It's like, well, that's not, probably not going to happen every year. Yeah, It's sort of, it's, it's similar like, to the NBA play in where you're like, Oh, what if this, what if this team is, is, is great and they lose in the play in. It's like that's you're gonna you undo it, but then one year it's not the exact opposite. A 36 win team is gonna get in, and then you have the exact opposite problem. So I don't think you can overreact too much to a one year happening. I think I think the three game series in the wild card is great. I really did enjoy that first weekend. Jay's results notwithstanding, my maybe small two is maybe I would make the ALDS best of seven now just to give uh, the, that higher seed one more shot. But I can also see that dragging. We're already playing. We're gonna be no. It's gonna be no November before the World Series ends, um, you could cut ten games off the regular season if you really wanted to. But you could also do maybe you could do to deal with the Guardians problem, like you know divisions aren't really a thing. Yeah. So you're whoever has the most wins are the ones who get through, and you know we're not going to give the Guardians home field advantage. But again, that's you know that's a small tweak, and I think what you said is perfect. Let's not overreact to things that happen in one year as if that's going to be the norm because we know that's not the case. Weird things will happen sometimes. There will be injustice in the world and in baseball, and it just needs to be accepted. Speaking of injustice and things that aren't real, <laughs> my bad take, all the problems everyone's had with playoff formats, with unfair things, with the way this year has turned out, it's all the National League. The National League is not real. This is all the weird things. You look back, all the weird things that happen year in, year out, it's always the National League. The, the 88-win Braves winning the World Series, National League. 2014, I think it, I think it was 2014. The Giants won 88 games, and won the World Series. 2006, the Cardinals won 83 games and won the World Series. It's always the National League. It's the National League every time. 
something is broken in the National League, and it's oh, it's always American <laughs> League is, is is baseball is the American League, and the National League is this weird other thing that sometimes wins the World Series because baseball is chaos. That is, is they did they had pitchers hitting until this year. It's completely <laughs> completely bonkers. Your problem with baseball is actually a problem with the National League, where the Phillies are a finalist team. The Padres can lose their can lose their most exciting player, and it doesn't matter. Hundred win teams losing in the division round. Uh, the National League hurts. It, it hurts my brain sometimes. The National League. I think I think that's a great bad take. Uh, I mean, you could you could do a, a, the first rebuttal that came to mind for me was the Royals twenty fourteen the year sure. before. Yeah, that amazing Oakland Athletics team, and then they get screwed into the wild card with the Royals, and the Royals somehow make that run, even though it isn't successful in the end. But you're right; a lot of the weird stuff has happened in the National League. Like you could make the argument, it's more fun. Like there, you know, there's more parody. Sure. I'm sick of always seeing the same teams. I'm sick of the Yankees being good all the time. I'm sick of the cheating Astros being great all the time, and the AL Central not mattering at all. Like in a sense, you could say the AL is more predictable and less exciting. But right now, you're right. What people seem to be complaining about is this notion that of what people deserve and what the Dodgers deserve, right. and the and in the National League, the Dodgers in particular. Uh, Fangraphs had a great piece about this, about how they're on literally from a regular season standpoint, one of the best sort of four or five year runs literally in baseball history. Yeah. Like there have been very few teams as successful as them and they have one World Series to show for it. And it's half the a, one that people like to put they have half a World Series to show for it. It's not an because <laughs> the playoffs were the same. They would like the regular Six, season is the part they have no games. problem with. Yes, so like they were going to kill that part anyway. <laughs> There's no asterisks on that World Series, but they should have many more if it were, you know, if it was the NBA, the Dodgers would be like the whatever Boston Celtics of the 70s or whatever decade it is sure. where they won all the titles. Uh, good, bad take. My good, bad take is a little bit more ticky tacky. It's, uh, I think they should shrink the rosters for the playoffs. Interesting. I am tired of the fact that, you know, I've said before, I don't like the way that you know, bullpen games and openers and stuff. I understand the strategy and I respect it. But the narrative thread of a baseball game rides with the starting pitcher. And I think that, that those performances in the playoffs, and this playoffs has been great for starting pitching, really make it exciting. And I don't like the teams have all these weapons to pull out. Like the, the game length increases in the playoffs drastically because they just keep bringing guys to the bullpen, including really good starters who now become high leverage relievers. If we're going to have all these days off that mean, oh, well, you don't really need a fourth starter. You don't really need a fifth starter. Why should you just get to have two more relievers then? Uh, no one's ever going to go for this. Uh, firstly, people <laughs> don't care. I'm like the first person to care about this. Secondly, uh, you <laughs> I'm know, intrigued enough. I'm managers, caring, but I'm intrigued. managers and baseball teams, you know, want to have all the options available to them, yada, yada, yada. So it, this will never happen. There will never be a drum beat for this. But yeah. Uh, shrink the rosters by let's say two in the playoffs. I think you snuck it in there nicely. The the point you made that in Tribune Mellis was the you don't need the five starters anymore. I think a, a different version of baseball years ago wanting to have all five year starters on the roster was something that just sort of oh, it's natural. This is our team. We bring them forward. I think now that we're looking at teams might go three deep. They might not even bother with the four starter. I think is as absolutely an astute point. Um I don't uh, listen. It'll never happen. <laughs> As your friend, no shot. But I love the passion. I I do think, uh, I do think you could see a limiting, maybe a limit in in pitchers usage. I don't know because I, I I get wary about taking away two because um you know the, the the hitting side of it, the base running, the defensive specialist doesn't bog it down nearly as much. Maybe you're limiting. I don't know, pitching changes in a game, maybe, maybe yeah, it, it's a complicated one. Yeah, I, you I, never can get over that line because they'll say, oh, what about safety? What about blah, blah? Does a, anyone want to see a position player in the playoffs? So, like, there'll always be a counter argument, uh, but I will never listen to any of that. That's BS about the safety. Yeah. If they, safety is, like, what they will do if they need to BS you, in a counterpoint. I like it, though. I do like the, I like the spirit of it. I like it. Um because it comes from a watching experience standpoint. It, it comes from literally how much fun is this to watch? And the answer is a little bit less, to be honest yeah. with you. And, and, it, and it has been trending that way for a number of years now as we see the way that, you know, these must-win baseball games are rolled out. Speaking of must-win baseball games, as we said, we're down to the final four. North Star Bets has your futures. We are going to update the World Series futures. Take a look 
at how the lines have changed and if we can still squeeze a little bit of value from the stone here on the run line. Nick, as I said, you can find your World Series futures. You've been able to all year long. North Star Bets, we can also find your insights on all the games. Four teams left. We've seen them play each other. We have a little bit of an idea of where the advantages and disadvantages lie. Of course, the lines have changed to reflect that. What do we have for our four lines, and where is your head going? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The Astros plus 100 at this point. Like you're too late. Real, yeah, it's too you've late. missed the bus at this point. Uh, I guess if you feel... Like they're a lock to win now that they are up one nothing on the Yankees as we record today. I don't think that's fair to say. The I was trying to work out before the show. I was like, is there a play here where you bet on both National League teams and they get plus odds in the end? But my thought is, by the time you get to the World Series, they're going to be underdogs anyway. So right. you might as well just wait and see where those odds lie. Chances are you're not going to lose out on that. So my pick is going to be the Yankees. It's a bit of a dart throw, we got here. but plus 550 for a team that was this successful, that has this much pitching talent at the top end. The bullpen isn't quite what it used to be, but it's still there. The top sort of four or five in the lineup, truly potent. Uh, they are down to the Astros, but you know what? Betting on them to claw their way out of that, like they would be serious minus odds by the time they make the World Series against either one of these National League teams. So if you put a ticket on them today, you could be looking at pretty crazy value if they can get out of this. We've been we've been beaten into submission. <laughs> Give up. Do it. Bet, on the, bet on the Yankees. Do it. Why not? Uh, I am going to continue to dig my heels in and say baseball is chaos. Life is chaos. Bet on the chaos. Go Phillies plus 360. Why not? What are we doing here? It, 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 there's no reason. There's no exp I cannot explain it to you in logical terms other than nothing else has made sense all year long. The National League isn't hey, real. They, they split in San Diego in theory. They have the advantage in that series now. Playoffs aren't real. National League isn't real. Uh, platoon advantages aren't real. Home field advantage isn't real. Only the Phillies are real. Nothing. It's, it's a Philly year. The, the Eagles are playing well. Go birds, go Phils, eat at Arby's. Like let's just let's forget it, blow it up, bet on the Phillies. <laughs> well, I don't care. Uh, no, I I just think um, we're at the point now as the numbers are small enough. Have just try to have fun, and to me, nothing is funnier continually than the Phillies' ongoing success. So Phillies a plus three sixty, Yankees a plus five fifty. You can get that and all of Nick's insights at North Star Bets, uh, a great place, and you can get on your futures week. Next time we talk could be World Series MVP. Could be future World time. Series time, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Uh, we will catch you right here on the Pitch Talks podcast for that. In the meantime, if you could leave us a like or a subscription or a review or a star rating or just reach out to Nick on Twitter and say thank you for all the great content, he would appreciate it. I would appreciate it from a distance. Uh, we appreciate your time and your questions. Nick, anything to say before we go? Uh, yeah, slide into my DMs to talk about arson. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> What other baseball podcast <laughs> will invite you to talk about arson if you get the chance? Uh, that is it for another week of Pitch Talks, uh, the AL and NLCS version. We will see you next time talking World Series right here. Pitch Talks brought to you by North Star Bets. That's a win. 